here's his presentation with the Protein Crisis Action Plan. Well, good morning. Oh, I don't get the microphone thing like the other speaker had? No, no, yours is Oh, that's too bad, because I know everybody liked that so much. <laughs> at, at least it kept you awake. So uh, uh, thanks very much. It's great to be here. Um, I want to talk about uh, the poaching crisis, but much more importantly, the kinds of stuff that you all could do to help. And I think you're hearing from the speakers how empowered you all could be. And I, and I really want to bring that message across. This guy here is the first tiger I saw in the wild. He was in Kana National Park in India. Very large male. And one of the things, if you haven't seen a tiger in the wild, um, you have kind of a genetic moment. And that is your DNA speaks to you. Being a, a slow, naked ape, whenever you get up next to a kitty cat like that, you kind of have a reaction like, I'm really next to a large, powerful predator. And uh, it's, it's an incredible, incredible opportunity. So um, we want you to have that opportunity, whether you take it or not. We want your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids. And I think that's why we're all here in this room this morning on this beautiful day. So I work for an organization called the National Wildlife Refuge Association. And for the most part, what I do is there are uh, 561 national wildlife refuges around the country in the United States. Um, there are a bunch here in South uh, Carolina. Any of the states that you're from, there are a bunch there. It's uh, 150 million acres, which is a lot of acres. Uh, and it runs from Maine to the Virgin Islands, all the way out past the Dateline into this Pacific Ocean. Um, but essentially what we do is uh, we lobby for, get good policy around the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, which is a government agency in the Department of Interior, and they are 9,000 people. So my gang of 30 employees and all our 40,000 supporters are around getting those 9,000 people and their $2.4 billion worth of conservation to do great work here in the United States, but also around the world. And the program uh, that focuses on wildlife conservation around the world is called Wildlife Without Borders. And so, um, the National Wildlife Refuge System has 40 million visitors a year and we have 40,000 friends and volunteers and one of the messages that we bring to those folks is help support all of the Fish and Wildlife Service including Wildlife Without Borders. And what I'd like to talk about today is what's known as the Multinational Species Conservation Fund and that is set up by Congress <coughs> And these are critters that the American public cares about and uh, makes grants around the world. So Angina was talking about a grant that Tiger Trust gets from the American public and that grant happens through the Multinational Species Conservation Fund, which are essentially elephants, Indian and African. Uh, they're great apes, uh, sea turtles, uh, rhinos and tigers. So that's what we support. We also have uh, a global program that supports all other critters that are out there. So we are making grants around the world except for Europe and Australia because they're rich and we don't need to be giving them money. Um, they've got money. And so specifically today I'd like to talk about the rhino and Tiger Fund, which is one of the funds that sits inside of this. And this is a picture of Kazaranga, and we have a rhino and a, a, bad, a little bad kitten who's following the rhino baby. So, but it all turned out well, so we're all good. <laughs> so as you heard yesterday, there's a couple of things that are going on and putting on pressure, and then we hear what's going on here in the United States. So there's a lot of work to do. And um, there's some good things happening in the world, but they have some consequences that 
uh, reach out to tigers and a whole bunch of other things. And that is um, Vietnam and China have a growing middle class. And that growing middle class um, is looking to parents, traditional medicine, and part of that traditional medicine is to use animal parts, and uh, which was fine um, back in the day, but since there are billions of people, uh, it puts an enormous amount of stress on dwindling wildlife populations. So somehow we need to um, look at this as a crisis, and there are multiple solutions to this, and one of the big causes is uh, huge numbers of folks and huge uh, demand for wildlife products. Uh, little uh, known fact, but the most expensive substance in the world, any idea? Diamonds? Nope. Drugs? Nope. Rhino horn. Yes. Most valuable substance on planet Earth. And do you know what rhino horn is made of? It's very magical stuff. Yeah. Uh, fingernail, same fingernail, keratin. So it, that's if you're really interested in rhino horn, just do nail biting and you got the same thing, absolutely same thing. <laughs> so we heard yesterday um, that tiger, different parts, uh, all kinds of cures, um, and we can have a debate Western, Eastern medicine. Let's not have that this morning. Um, usually there are good Western substitutes. Um, but we also have other stuff that's going on. We just have huge numbers of people in Asia, uh, in India. Um, there are a billion folks. India is considerably smaller than the United States. Um, and so uh, we've got about 300 million people here. There's a billion people in India. So uh, let's talk about our predators. Name a big predator here in North America, one of the students. No, 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 big predator. Yeah, bear, grizzly bear, let's pick a grizzly bear. And where are you from? Do you have grizzly bears in New Jersey? Would you tolerate grizzly bears in New Jersey? Okay, well, India is settled like New Jersey. So the fact that they are tolerant of large predators wandering around a place like New Jersey is amazing. And so um, there are going to be people, animal conflicts. And we can look down our big noses at India and say, well, of course, save the tigers. But would we want grizzly bears wandering around New Jersey? Uh, we probably wouldn't. So India is amazing on their tolerance. And here's Indonesia in the other corner, um, also a place with enormous numbers of people. The highest density of people in the world is Jakarta um, and uh, the um, uh, island of Java. And so also um, those lots of people are very hungry for natural resources. So they chop rainforests down and they plant this wonderful plant up here on the right. Do we know what that is? <coughs> Oil palm. And so a lot of rainforest gets converted to this, which becomes energy. So uh, oil palm is also a giant issue as we talk about tigers and wildlife conservation in Asia. So we've got wildlife products, we have pressures on natural resources, and we have a lot of people. So we've got kind of a perfect storm of issues that are facing tigers and you will hear in other speeches where there are tigers there are likely lots of other biodiversity that will come along so if you guys get excited about your mascots not only can you protect tigers but you can bring a lot of other critters along for that ride and these are the kinds of places um, that the u.s fish and wildlife service supports um, so if you all who's got summer jobs you, you paying tax? Thank you, because uh, some minor unmeasurable, they don't have a machine on this beautiful complex, but some unmeasurable portion of a penny um, goes to doing this kind of conservation work. This is Kana, uh, which is a large com forest complex, a salt forest complex um, in central India with 
um, probably some of the highest densities of, of, of tigers. Um, and it's, it's, it's also um, attracts a lot of uh, folks to come, come look at the tigers, as it did myself. So this is a uh, Rontham boar. Um, that's that fa famous tigress. Um, another very, very important place for tigers in India. And there are, there are parks around India that the Fish and Wildlife Service, your tax dollars, uh, invests in local efforts um, to help conservation. And uh, that's a variety of different efforts that we can talk about in a little bit. So this is uh, Kazaranga, which is also uh, in India. It's in the, uh, it's in the <coughs> northeast corner of India. It's more tropical. Um, and along for the tiger ride uh, comes elephant, uh, Indian rhino. Um, I think um, Angina mentioned that uh, there are 44 poached rhinos this year alone. Um, and um, uh, kind of rhino statistics. Uh, there is a 6,000% increase in rhino poaching over the last three years uh, around the world. Uh, elephant poaching is enormous. Um, and so, um, and this is a water buffalo, which is very common in its domestic form in Asia, uh, but there are very few wild uh, buffaloes left. So if we can protect tigers, we can bring a suite of endangered wildlife along for that ride. And a lot of the management and stewardship needs of tigers, if we can solve that, we're likely to do the same uh, for elephants and rhinos in Asia. So this is the Western Forest Complex in Thailand. Um, this is a big success story. Uh, Thailand has brought a lot of resources in the last several years, and poaching was pretty much rampant and is now much down, um, and it is um, a stronghold for tiger conservation, and it's a different subspecies, so it's not the same tigers as Angina has in India. So we, we not only are looking at tiger conservation in terms of overall tigers, but we're looking in subspecies of tigers, um, and, and so we, we need to have uh, investments in different parts of the tiger range so that we're looking at all the different subspecies and keeping them. And, and as mentioned last night, we have lost subspecies. So the Bali and the Java tiger are gone they, and they will never come back. And so how can we prevent the Bengal and the Malay tiger from going as well? And, and so we want to invest in these different hot spots where we have the best chance of, of bringing survival because there are places that we will not be able to save tigers or bring them back because the pressures are just too much. So where are the places that we really can make a difference? And uh, this western Thailand border, and that, that's um, Myanmar or Burma on the, on the other side. So it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a very large forest complex. Um, this is Sumatra, northern Sumatra. Um, this is the Gunur Laser. Um, ecosystem and there's a national park and uh, it's under enormous pressure right now. In fact, uh, the state government has decided uh, or is considering um, uh, logging large areas of this, which is some of the last remaining um, forest in, in Sumatra. It is the, the largest area for Sumatran tiger and um, it has a species of ape found um, nowhere else in the world, the Sumatran uh, orangutan. So not only can we, if we protect tigers, we can uh, protect orangs as well. And uh, of course we want to do that. And if you haven't seen orangs in the wild, go see them. They're, they're absolutely amazing. And this is an amazing country. Um, and it goes all the way from the ocean up to um, very tall mountains and with incredible um, river valleys, and uh, it is uh, virtually undiscovered by, by Western tourists. And this is the Sumatran rhino, which is, uh, used to be on uh, all over peninsula Southeast Asia. It's gone, um, and it is only on the islands of Borneo and Sumatra, and the only really 
um, large population is in Sumatra, um, and there was actually a big agreement between Malaysia and Indonesia quite recently because this rhino numbers are plummeting, and we estimate 150 left, and so they are being po poached for our fingernails. So um, if we can protect the Sumatran tiger, um, we, we can likely protect uh, this fellow as well, which is very difficult to find and see, um, but like tigers uh, are relatively easy to poach um, because it's a beautiful critter, uh, but it's not the brainiest critter of all time. So lastly, uh, the Russian Far East, um, which has Siberian, but actually more correctly, morgue tigers, which uh, are large because it's cold. And um, I have never been, I really want to go because um, the idea of tigers wandering around in forests that look like our forest is just, for whatever reason, seemingly a really cool idea. Oaks and hickories and birches um, and uh, feeding on moose and, and elk, they call red deer. Um, and it also um, is the last home for uh, more leopards. And, uh, and, and Russia has been adding protected areas and, and, and national parks to this part. I've worked with World Wildlife Fund of Russia, um, and um, a lot of the stuff that we're working in the U.S., kind of collaborative, building friends kind of thing, has worked out well here. And wildlife is full of weird politics, and the weird politics of the world, as, as Russia becomes less democratic, um, we've got Mr. Putin who happens to like tigers. Um, and so as Russia was democrat or experimented with democracy, um, the tigers were going down because the rule of law in that part of the world was not so great. But m Mr. Putin with his iron hand has said, you shall not take tigers and people listen. So we've got a population of tigers that are, are rising. Um, maybe not the best politics, but at least favorable for, for both um, uh, leopards and tigers in this part of the world. So what can we do about this and how can we protect these incredible places? And um, the kinds of things that we need to do are stewardship and management. We don't want to create these paper parks. They need rangers and managers. Um, we need to be doing wildlife management, um, the translocation. Um, this was a cat that had been um, being kind of naughty and taken village dogs and got moved further inland and was happy to get out of that Land Rover. Um, we need forest guards. Um, we need all kinds of uh, activities inside of the park to make this more than just a gazetted paper park. We need to make it a real park. And uh, the other kinds of things that we need to do are the education. Um, if we don't have people in the villages around it supporting this, um, if we don't have good science, uh, we're going to be at a loss. So getting kids out there um, and getting research done in these places are very, very important. And so what does this take? What does it take to do all this? Now, Angina would say it would take passion, and it absolutely does. But I'm not Angina, so what it takes is um, how do we make these great things happen? It's about money, honey. <laughs> we got to find some money to make this work. Um, and so I'm not the spiritual part of the, the presentation. I'm a lobbyist, and, and we need to go find money. And that building right there uh, is a good place to find it. Um, that's the Capitol building in the United States um, uh, of America, uh, Capitol in Washington, D.C., and, uh, and that's my, my Mallard friend there. Um, and so this is where kind of our partnership, this is Dan Ash, who's uh, director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so we work very closely with the Fish and Wildlife Service and we've got to put budgets together. And, and so we look at the whole US Fish and Wildlife Service budget. And here's where you guys can really come in. Um, we're looking at very tough fiscal times. We're broke, we've had two oars, 
and uh, we have an entitlement system that was designed for having a, a, a few people who actually make it to old age and lots of young people. That's a more kind of third world when we were in the 1930s and 40s when we invented this. And now we're like this. There's fewer young people and lots of gray hair old people and the system's broken. And then you throw on top of that that we're all about this big and we need a lot of health care and there's a real strain on the system and, and we're going to have to fix that. And, and that's a, another whole talk. But it's entitlements and it's tax reform, it's a lot of things. But in the meantime, are we going to let tigers and rhinos go extinct? And is that really what's making us go broke? Absolutely not. It's decimal dust. It's nothing. So, you know, for what we could save tigers, Afghanistan, okay, what we spent in Afghanistan, when I clapped, we could save tigers in the United States, okay, uh, for, uh, in, across the world, all right? So, do it again. Ready? Okay. That time period, just from Afghanistan, we can save all tigers. We save everything like that, all right? So we just need them to, so we, we can find the money. It's the will. We need to find the money. And, uh, and so how do we do this? We need to build a constituency that cares. Congress reacts to what people tell them to do. It's not, they don't just do their thing. They're worried about getting reelected. They are always worried about being reelected. And so they need to hear from real people. And you heard the bills coming from California. California is a beautiful, wonderful state. It's not real people. <laughs> I, I'm, I, I live uh, uh, near Vermont, not real people. Real people come from red states. And red states are, are, are the, the states that don't want to spend money on this. And so if we can make this a motherhood apple pie save your mascot issue, yes. South Carolina, Texas, then we can really make this happen and you all have that power to do that. And so we try to put diverse groups of people together. So I've got cowboys coming in and talking about money for wildlife. I got sportsmen, I got bird watchers, I have urban folks, and so if you mascot folks want to come on board, great, because that's what we need is a diverse group of people that are coming into Washington and talking about we need to find that kind of money. We can make the red states turn orange. That's right. <laughs> so the other thing that I need and this talk is all about me, in case you were wondering, uh, is if you look at all that, everybody, everybody in the conservation movement, we're all old. And we need young people. We need young people. And when we were your age, we were out smoking pot and doing the thing. And, and, and we need you guys to get involved and, and, and join in this. And you will really make a difference. You'll, you'll turn heads in Washington with your youth and and you think that most of the most of you know senator big deal most of his staff is 24 25 26 years old and they doing the Facebook Twitter I don't know what they're talking about go in and talk to them you know how to talk their talk and you know how to communicate to them and they're the ones that make Washington work it's not the old they just listen to their staffs so you're their age, you can reach out, and you're from the, the right state, states. So this is what the 2004 request is. So we're going into the budget year. If you watch the news, and if you're that brave, we're starting a new budget year. So there's 1.567 for overall fish and wildlife operations. That's not monies that go out to the state. That's another billion dollars. But that's just for work in the Fish and Wildlife Service. There's 9.78 million for this multi-species fund. We want another 20 million that Hillary Clinton talked about coming from the U.S. State Department to Fish and Wildlife for this project. State Department has giant money. Fish and Wildlife Service, small money. 
So just a little bit of that giant money to be moved over to Fish and Wildlife to address this huge crisis that's going on. And we can thank Chelsea, uh, who, went, who works for NBC and went, did a big uh, interview in Africa and came back and said, this is horrible, Mom, we need to do something about it. And she said, well, gee, I'm really powerful. I'll try to do something about it. <laughs> and so, but, but now we need Congress to make that happen because it's Congress that does the money. And there's $13.5 million for international affairs. And then I had to throw in this last one, which has nothing to do with tigers, but it's where I get employed from, $4.99 for National Wildlife Refuges. So um, I invite you all, and we can do the other bills as well. I have an office in Washington. I have paid lobby staff. Um, and when you get out of school, June, July, August, that's when all of this is decided. Come to Washington. We'll get you set up. We can have you visit the Hill. You can go meet with your congressionals and talk about tigers. You can talk about money and these other bills that are out there. That's an invitation to you. And as you get out into the job market, you'll like to have these little things on your resumes. So I invite you to come to Washington, especially the folks from the South because Washington in June is quite comfortable. It's only like 100. Put a suit on, it's a lot of sweating involved and going around and wearing out shoe leather. So come to Washington and have your voice be heard because nine letters is what it usually takes. If you show up there in person, you can really make a difference. So I invite you all to come to Washington. And so write and visit your representative and senator. That's number one. Number two, write and visit your representative and senator. Number three, write and visit your representative and senator. Okay, shall I go over those three points again? All right. I think they were very experienced. <laughs> yeah, write and visit your representative and senator. So give to a conservation organization that cares. We're all desperate for money right now. And so look at those folks that are really trying to make a difference. The other thing that you can do, and I know a lot of you don't ever buy stamps. We've got a stamp out uh, extinction. We've raised seven million dollars. So uh, I don't know if you guys ever use them. Do you ever use the mail anymore? Okay. So if you use the mail, buy stamps, buy tiger stamps. All right, that's seven million dollars that we've raised. And uh, the other stamp that you can buy um, is a duck stamp, which uh, helps National Wildlife Refuges. So, um, and, and the other thing that you can do is go outside. You guys are all stuffed in your phone all the time. Get outside. Um, <laughs> go to Kana National Park, but if you can't make it to Kana, go, go to Charlie Russell in Montana. There, there's big cats there. Do you know where these places are down here? No, this is Congaree National Park in South Carolina. See that sea turtle and, and that little puppy there? That's South Carolina. That's right here. Get outside and, and bring your friends because you need to kind of keep, keep that excitement going. You're not, I mean, unless you're Angina, you're not going to be able to go see tigers every day. So keep that excitement going by stuff that you can do around here. So this is my contact. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. And uh, happy to answer any questions that you may have. My question, how do you motivate these students, though you have given them away, that from now onwards, that 20 million, whatever, is proposed in our, as a group, they can manage to persuade is one method. Otherwise, can these young students can be absorbed in short-term programs anywhere in the U.S. so that they get the first-hand experience? Yes, ab absolutely. So uh, on your behalf, your attorney. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, get get involved, and yes. and uh, and jobs are are going to be tough as you get out of school, and and uh, so you know we we'll. we'll be able to work together to help you on uh, resume and and to do you know great great work and um, 
I noticed that Marilyn was here. Um, your senator is chair of the Appropriations Committee. And so that's a big deal. She is a big deal. Uh, South Carolina, um, uh, uh, Louisiana, all red states that generally are not so happy about supporting some of this uh, kind of conservation work. So going in and changing some lines um, in your states are huge. So uh, I ask you to come to Washington. We can get you organized in any way you would like. Um, you know, reach out for help as you think about how this group comes together. Um, we'll support you in any way we can. We can try to find, you know, a little seed money, all that kind of stuff, because we really think you guys can make a big, big difference. So what, what would they say to a, a senator in South Carolina or Louisiana? How, how is this going to help our states? Well, I mean, I, all politics are local. And so, uh, you know, you go in and say, you know, I'm sorry, I can't do the Southern football talk, but, um, <laughs> the, you know, do you really care about football team, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the mascot is the tiger. So, yeah, I mean, I went running this morning. You got a big tiger paw on the giant water tower. I mean, you guys are taking this seriously. <laughs> and, and so get that started and say, it, look, this is this wild, beautiful, magnificent critter, and there's 3,000 of them in the wild, and there's an enormous amount of pressure. How are we going to be if we're, our mascot is gone? Just gone, vanished. Or the only place we can see them is in the cage. There's something that undermines that whole school spirit, et cetera. And so we, as a superpower, it's not just about aircraft carriers. We have a responsibility on planet Earth to do good things. And so we have to clean up our act here in America, and we have to be generous abroad. And so you can, Senator, Congressperson, support uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service budget and this legislation um, that would clean up our act at home so that when we are having conversations with the Chinese, which we are, that the Chinese don't have all this awfulness to point back at us. I mean, why are you judging us when we, we don't have our own act together? So going up there with a combination of the legislation that we were talking about this morning, plus appropriations, uh, is a great ask. And uh, remember, nine letters. One visit trumps nine letters, like rock, paper, scissors. So you can play that game of getting up there. And really, it's about the squeaky wheel. You know, you just need to kind of keep going and keep going. That's why I said three times. You just, this is not a one-shot deal. Then they just think you're not really serious. But if you can start to build momentum, they will listen. I promise you. And if you can do that, Ajahn and I will take you to see tigers. <laughs> promise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, because I used to work for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, I know that our friends groups and local organizations near your school probably go to visit the hill um, sometime during the year. So maybe you can help like, connect with your refuge association near you and then go together, like it's just a drive away if you're on the East Coast. <laughs> so yeah, that might be an idea to get the youth up there along with the Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, the Friends Groups. Yep. Yeah. And there's a bunch of Friends Groups here in Carolinas and Maryland and sure. Louisiana and Florida, all the places that you're from, we've already got people coming in and, and so we can help you get involved and or you can go on your own, whatever, wherever you prefer. Any other questions? Could I just say, uh, and in support of what he said, there are <coughs> maybe 17,000 current students at Clemson University, maybe in the order of 100,000 alumni, maybe 100 plus thousand friends on the university Facebook site, we have Twitter. We can reach enormous numbers of people through the university and the friends and alumni and families University. There are only two major universities in the state, 
and uh, you know, tigers and chickens. And um, <laughs> they both cohabit the same forest, by the way, but only one little spring. But, um, <laughs> but the point is, Lindsey Graham, Senator Graham, grew up nine miles from this campus. And there are only two universities in the state, and everyone in the state is either a Clemson fan or a Carolina fan. And he wants to get reelected. He can't. He has to support both those, right? He's, and this is true, in, you know, where there are big Tiger universities, <laughs> Missouri, and LSU, and Auburn, and so on. If you guys, or if we go to our senator and say, "Do you love tigers?" He has to say yes. <laughs> I mean, I think he genuinely does. He's often supportive of conservation efforts. But the point is, he has to say yes, right? Because everyone in the state loves tigers. The, what we have to do is convert that love of tigers into knowledge of the real threats to tigers and then political action. And, and as students at a university, you have a mouthpiece that's in pro. And, and that's why all these people showed up at this conference, because they're talking to students. They're not just talking to one room full of students. Potentially, they're talking to huge constituencies across the Southeast. And, I, you know, this $20 million is more than double the resources, right, for poaching. Yeah, one shot. Yep, nine point seven eight is what we got last year. So in Washington, flat is the new op. Great. Um, and so uh, that goes that goes to South Africa. They've already lost uh, four hundred rhinos in Kruger National Park alone. Uh, it goes to elephant poaching in Africa. Uh, the Wildlife Conservation Society came out that. In Central Africa, forest elephants are down in a decade by 60%. Decade, gone. So that money is shared throughout. So if we could take $20 million and specifically put it towards um, the poaching crisis, that, that is much more than double. That's probably triple. And what happens is groups like Tiger Trust they bring their own resources, so it's not $20 million. We're talking probably, once it's leveraged, $100 million worth of conservation. And $100 million in the United States of conservation is a lot. $100 million bucks in India is huge, or Indonesia. So, you know, things are much less expensive to get things done in other countries. So you could have an enormous effect and you could say, you know, when I was at Clemson, tigers were going to go extinct. And your grandmother kept that from happening. That would be huge. And that's really where you sit right now. In your lifetimes, tigers will either make it or they won't. And you can blame me and I can blame my father and we can just keep going now. Or you guys can be the generation that makes that happen. It's a great, thanks for being here.